We'll be in Daniel chapter 6. Daniel chapter 6. If you were called on to give a theme or a recurring theme in the prophecy or in the book of Daniel, what would be the things that come to mind? What? Lion's Den, we're headed there tonight. Okay, don't give in, don't give up. Maintain who you are throughout your life. Uh, that's, that's the message through the first six chapters at least. And it's given to us from different viewpoints, from different situations, but the key characters stay about the same. You've got Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And all of them are seen holding on to their integrity, holding on to their faith, and Daniel 6 is no different. So we're going to be looking at the same general idea, but again from a different viewpoint. And we're in a different kingdom now. If you remember, uh, at the end of chapter 5, we lose the Babylonians. So now we're living under the Medo-Persian Empire, and Darius the Mede is the king at this point. So chapter 6, verse 1, It pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom, with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. Okay? So what is a satrap? We've run across that word a few times, but we haven't defined it. A satrap was a provincial, uh, a provincial governor. Right? So these are the under rulers to uh, King Darius. He's got lots of these governors in different places. But then he has some administrators who are responsible for overseeing the work of the rest of the governors. And Daniel is one of those three. So now he has worked for uh, the Babylonians and is now working for the Medo-Persians. He'll make it all the way through to the, the time of Cyrus the Persian. So uh, he has a very long career in public service. And everybody that comes to power, as soon as they pinpoint who Daniel is, they want him. I, I don't know who would be a good example. Maybe some of you that are more political than I am would know a name. But there are jobs that come and go with administrations. If there's a Republican who's in uh, the White House, then we'll have a, a new group of folks that are in charge of things. If a Democrat comes in, then we'll have a different group in charge of things. But surely, in all of that, there are some people that are just so good at what they do that no matter who's the current power broker, those folks are still in their jobs. Somebody that's worked in Washington in the same job for, say, 20, 30, 40 years, who's just getting the job done so well that both sides of the aisle prize their abilities. Uh, Daniel seems to have been that kind of guy. When they come into power, they look at his job record and they say, you know, we don't really care who he worked for in the past or where he was born, for that matter. We know that he's good at his job, and so we're going to keep him. And that put Daniel in a really good place to do a lot of good things. Verse 3, Daniel uh, so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king was planning to set him over the whole kingdom. So he was going to evidently be the lead among the three who were the lead of all the governors. Uh, at this time, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. So they went to work. They tried to check up on him, find out something that they could use against him, but they couldn't. Uh, again, we have a foreigner getting promoted ahead of locals. No longer are we dealing with the Babylonian locals. Now we're dealing with the leadership of the Medes. 
And so the Medo-Persian Empire has its own group of folks. They've got them in place. Darius is chosen from among uh, whomever he uh, respected and wanted in these jobs. But Daniel is about to be the top dog, and they don't want it. So they try to find some way of getting rid of him. Now, Daniel is not a Babylonian. He's not a Medo-Persian. He's a Jew. He is a captive Jew. Right? So, I mean, he started out with just no standing at all, and now he's about to be head over everything yet again. So these men are doing their best to find a way to stop that. Verse 5, finally these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man Daniel unless it has something to do with the law of his God. So the word is out. If you want to get Daniel, you've got to get at him through his uh, dedication to his God. Right? He's a Jew. He's dedicated to Yahweh. He's not going to undo that. So maybe we can use that as a way to get rid of him. And so these administrators and satraps went as a group to the king and they said, may King Darius live forever. Uh, you'll see that phrase pop up two or three times in this passage. It, it seems kind of like if you're in the British Isles and the greeting is God save the king. Right, so uh, may Darius live forever. The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human being during the next 30 days, except to you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. What's really interesting about that phrase is it begins with the word all. Who is about to be the chief over all these guys? Where's his vote if all of them decided that they needed to have this guy call for praise for himself? I don't think Daniel got an invitation to the meeting. I think Daniel was somewhere else when these guys got their heads together to tempt the king with this edict. Now, your majesty, issue the decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the law of the Medes and Persians which cannot be repealed. So King Darius put the decree in writing. There was something special in their culture about putting a law down on paper, on parchment, or however they were keeping those things, that then it was solid. You could not undo it. We'll run into in the book of Esther that such a decree is made that it's open season on the Jews. And when the king finds out that his wife is a Jew and finds out that Mordecai has been sneaking around trying to get the property of the Jews, he has to come up with a, another answer. And basically the answer is, I will make another decree that does not get everybody off the hook. It doesn't change the decree I already made, but I'll make a decree that the Jews can defend themselves. And so the Jews do defend themselves and God gives them the victory. But they are a captive people and it would not have been normal for them to be armed or to to fight back against Mordecai and his forces, but he makes a decree. So the law of the Medes and Persians, you may have heard that phrase used to describe a law that's just, you know, it, it's set in concrete. You cannot change it. You cannot alter it. Uh, one of the things about our laws in the United States that is a good thing is that from time to time they need to be revisited. Uh, and when they are revisited, sometimes good decisions are made. Some, Not always. But, you know, they're, they're not so set that we can't undo, redo, repeal, make changes to the laws that are already there. The Medo-Persians, it was part of their law that once the law was there, you couldn't do anything about it. In verse 10, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and he prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Uh, I went and looked up some numbers on how often different groups pray. Anybody familiar with Islam? I think it's four times a day. Five. For, five for the Muslims. Um, and they are at set times. When I was in junior college at uh, Mesquite, there was a fellow in class with us, 
And that was a time when it was not good to be from Iran. Uh, and it was about the time of the Iran hostage uh, affair. And this fellow, I don't remember where he told us he was from, but we were all pretty sure he was from Iran. But he would just stop in the middle of the hallway at a particular time of day. He knew the orientation toward Mecca, and he would put his prayer rug down, and he would go into prayer. I mean, there was, it didn't matter what the schedule had on it other than that. That was what he was going to do. Uh, it's difficult not to respect people who are dedicated to prayer, right? but five times a day in the Islamic community. How many times for the Jews? Daniel was three times a day, right? And in modern times, it's still three times a day. Uh, most Orthodox Jews will pause three times a day, and they do pray toward Jerusalem if they can. If they know where Jerusalem is, they try to orientate themselves toward Jerusalem. Uh, and by the way, we talk about the Jews of the diaspora, the, those that were run out of Jerusalem in 70. Uh, they still refer to themselves that way, people who are exiled from Jerusalem, and they pray toward Jerusalem, even though there's no temple there. It would make sense in the early days, if there was a temple there, like Daniel, that you would open your windows toward Jerusalem. You would be praying toward where a Jew would think that's where God is or that's where God should be in Jerusalem. So three times a day for those guys. What about Christians? How often do Christians pray? <laughs> Very seldom. There, there was one piece I found that talked about the early Christians praying seven times daily, that it was a, a regular schedule that they prayed. Uh, haven't found anything else that, that mentioned that. I might find it later. I, I did look to see just by uh, different studies that they've done, typically... Christian men, 40% uh, pray at least once a day. Okay, so about less than half, but 40% pray daily. The women are doing a little bit better at 60% who pray daily. Okay, so that leaves 30% of the women and 60% of the men who go at least one day without praying at all. Okay. When we pray, do we face somewhere? Typically, the Christians that I know face downward. In our culture, we lower our heads. Uh, we were told as kids, bow your head and close your eyes. Why did we bow our head and close our eyes? To show reverence to God, to show reverence to God or so that you're not distracted, right? So that you're zeroed in and your mom doesn't have to thump you in the middle of the prayer. Uh, I don't know whether we were praying at the time or not, but my mother was a pincher. And there was one time at the home congregation in Lewisburg, Tennessee, that I got pinched and yelled, Mama, don't pinch me. Uh, it got worse from there. <laughs> so, um, but it, it's sad that more of us don't pray more often. Uh, in Scripture, there's a lot of hand raising in prayer, Old Testament and New Testament. Uh, Paul says, I want men to, to pray at all times raising up holy hands. Uh, that's not our posture in the modern church, typically, uh, at least in places where I've worshipped. We're, we're looking down rather than looking up. But the idea, right, the uh, Islam looks toward Mecca because that's where Muhammad was from. The Jews looked toward Jerusalem and continue to do so because that's where they consider home and where God ought to be at the temple. And Christians look down in reverence but we don't look toward something, not typically. But anyway, uh, for Daniel, it was three times a day looking out the window with the windows open. So it wasn't hard to, to know what Daniel was doing or to keep up with what he had in mind. He was going to pray three times a day. Verse 11, these men went as a group and they found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about the royal decree. Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any god or human being except to you, your majesty, would be thrown into the lion's den? 
The king answered, The decree stands in accordance with the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. Yes, I wrote it. Therefore, we can't do anything about it. And I feel sorry for the guy. I honestly do. Uh, he let himself be duped into doing this. He let his ego uh, get him to write something down. And he, I'm sure he immediately saw the flaw. And then when Daniel is the subject of ridicule, I think he liked Daniel. He didn't want something bad to happen, but he wrote it down. Now, he's the king, yes? <laughs> Why can't he just go, well, we're changing the way we do law around here. Uh, the Medo-Persian used to be, if you write it down, that it's there forever, but I've, ch I've decided that that's not the way it is anymore. Uh, it kind of ends up that way in the end, but he doesn't repeal the law and doesn't feel that he is at leisure to do so. Thirteen. They said to the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, your majesty, or to the decree you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. When the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. Notice it does not say he was angry. Right? He wasn't hacked off with Daniel. He was distressed. He was cut to the heart. He was determined to rescue Daniel and he made every effort until sundown to save him. What kinds of things could he have been doing until sundown? Trying to figure out a way around the edict, you know. wonder if he got it out and read it ten more times. Well, if, if you took this word to mean this, if you interpreted this this way, maybe we could come up with a way around this. He can't find a way to save Daniel. So again, he's the king. He has all the power in the world, at least in their known world. He was the most powerful guy that any of them had ever met. But he feels obligated to keep the word because he wrote it down. So I, I like the guy. You know, I, I think that he was, uh, he's doing the wrong thing, but for all the right reasons, perhaps. The men went down as a group to King Darius and said to him, Remember, your majesty, according to the law of Medes and Persians, no decree or edict the king uh, issues can be changed. So the king gave the order. They brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. What did the king just do? He honored a God beside himself in the effort to console and encourage Daniel. What was the law? You can't pray to anybody except to him. You can't honor anybody except him. And he just said, may the God that you've always worshipped take care of you. So it doesn't help, but it's uh, the king's heart, again, seems to be in the right place. He's caught in the satrap's trap. Uh, verse 17. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring, and with the rings of his nobles, so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. The king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating, without any entertainment being brought to him, and he could not sleep. Now, I want you to notice the foreshadowing in this passage. I think it's really neat. Um, you have a group of guys who cook up some accusations. They have a trial that is only among those in the know. Daniel is thrown inside a cave and a big rock is rolled in front of it. And then they put seals on the rock to make sure that Daniel or his friends or somehow that, that his situation cannot be changed. Does that sound familiar at all? That sounds exactly like Jesus, doesn't it? Right? You've got cooked up uh, charges. You've got a, a cave with a big rock rolled in front to make sure that nothing changes. And the outcome is the same, right? Early in the morning, the king goes back to find out if Daniel is okay. And Daniel is just fine. Thank you. Verse 19, at the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near to the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? So, Again, there's a recurring theme in Daniel. And the theme always ends up with God taking care of those 
who are faithful. Go all the way back to the first chapter. We're not going to eat your food. We're going to eat kosher food and just check us in 10 days and see if we aren't doing just fine. 10 days later, God honors them because they honored him. Right? Uh, you, you go to uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We're not going to bow down to your statue. Uh, if God saves us, good. If God doesn't save us, good. But we're not going to bow down to your statue. God rescues them. So here's Daniel thrown in the lion's den. Uh, whatever has to happen, has to happen. He gets thrown in, but the king wants to know, did the living God, the God that you serve, has he been able to save you? And Daniel answered, may the king live forever. Long live the king. My God sent his angel, and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me because I found I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I ever done anything wrong before you, your majesty. So note the presence again of an angel. How often do angels show up? When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are in the fiery furnace, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar goes, oh, I thought I threw three of them in there. And now there's four, and the fourth one looks like a son of the gods. Uh, we talked about it. We didn't necessarily come up with an absolute, but probably an angelic being of some kind. Uh, was this the same angel that came and shut the mouths of the lions for Daniel, or was it another one? Uh, things that happen in the heavenlies that we don't get to know about, you know? We, God, Maybe God sent this angel and said, you go make sure that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are okay. They're mine. Angel goes, takes care of it. Uh, then the net, when Daniel gets thrown in the lion's den several years later, did that angel go, hey, I did good last time. Do I get to go again? Or did God choose somebody else and send them? Uh, I'm looking forward, I think, to, to meeting an angel, to, to find out what it's like to be them. I mean, we, we know what it's like to be humans, but what's it like to be an angel? What's it like for someone to have lived in the heavenlies for all these millennial and to be in the presence of God for all this time and to be a servant doing different things for the Lord at different times. I think that must be amazing. And I imagine they're, they're amazing uh, creatures is the word that comes to my mind, but that's not a nice word. Uh, beings. They're just amazing beings. Uh, there's also another similarity here. We've got a group that hates foreigners um, they, they're they given the opportunity to fit in. Right? If you'll do what we tell you to do, then you'll be all right. Uh, a reluctance of the king to make them, uh, you know, to hurt them, even though that's the law that's been made. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, you know, now you guys, you, you've got to fall down and worship. Well, we're not going to. And then he eventually has to throw them into the fire. Um, and then the king gives praise to God. So we've got a Babylonian king that praises God. And now we've got a Medo-Persian king that gives praise to God. Do the Babylonians ever convert to worship Yahweh? No. Pieces here and there. Do the Medo-Persians ever convert and worship Yahweh? No. Just bits and pieces here and there. They honor God verbally on different occasions. They don't honor him with their lives or by making him the, the chosen God of their people. At the king's command, the men who had falsely accused Daniel were brought in and thrown into the lion's den. I'm okay that, with that so far. What's the next phrase? along with their wives and their children. That's tough. That's like when, when you go to Jericho and you say, kill them all. Okay, well, you kill the warriors. It's a, it's a battle. But you kill the warriors and the wives and the children and the livestock, right? Everything goes at Jericho. Um, this is King Darius. He's the king. He makes a decree. And once he makes that decree, you can't take it back. All the, the men who had falsely accused Daniel 
were brought in and thrown in the lion's den, along with their wives and children. And before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed all of their bones. Without being too disrespectful to those guys and their families, the lions were hungry because the angel wouldn't let them eat last night. So they were ready for a meal and, and they got a meal. Now, go back to their own claim. All of the satraps are in on this, right? Well, obviously not. Daniel wasn't. Maybe there were some others who were not in on the the plan to get rid of Daniel. But this isn't like two or three guys. This is a bunch of governors and their wives and their kids that are thrown to the lions at the hands of Darius the Mede. So it was a, a horrible response, but perhaps a just one in some ways. King Darius wrote to all the nations and peoples of every language in all the earth. Okay? All those with whom he was familiar anyway. May you prosper greatly. I issued a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves he performed signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus, the Persian. How old was Daniel? He's over 70, maybe close to 80 when he goes to the lion's den. So by the time that Cyrus is in, he's a very old man. As far as... I know, and from what I can, can come up with, uh, Daniel never went home. He worked for Babylonians. He worked for the, the uh, Medo-Persians all the way up until he died. Uh, during the reign of Cyrus, the people are going to get to go back. King Cyrus is going to send the people back to Jerusalem to rebuild. But as far as I can tell, Daniel did not go. He was either too old for that trip or was just in his place, and you know, when, when you move there when you're 15, and you live there till let's say, 90, it's an awfully long time to live in one place, and then say, well, I'll, I think I'll just go back to Jerusalem. Um, when they do, you have some old people that go back, and you have some young people that go back to rebuild Jerusalem, but I really don't think Daniel was part of that group. So we'll, Lord willing, uh, keep going in Daniel, but that kind of gives us the, the rest of his career. We're going to start looking at some of his uh, other dreams and interpretations uh, in the remainder of the uh, book. Any other thoughts, questions?